Hello there from the Kamani team. This time we will be testing and reviewing the latest range of NVIDIA cards, the RTX series from Gigabyte. These are the RTX 2070, 2080 and 2080 Ti. It's worth noting that the gaming range comes overclocked out of the box, but more on that later on. A top tier card from the range, the 2080 Ti from the RTX series will be the focus of this video. Despite that, we will post the results for other cards as well. On the RTX 2080 Ti card, there's several connectivity ports, three display ports, one HDMI and one Type-C. The cooling system consists of three coolers, a large ALU radiator with heat pipes. Let's take a closer look at the board without these components attached. Here we have 11 GDDR6 chips that run at a frequency of 1750 MHz. So the overall power output stands at 14 MHz. The adapter makes use of a complicated 16 stage power supply scheme. 13 of those are devoted to the GPU and a further three support the memory. The card has six copper dissipation tubes dispersed all around the cooling system which suggests high heat dissipation of the new solution by NVIDIA. Due to the direct contact between the GPU board and the heat dissipation tubes, the cooling system should in theory perform well. Overall, the whole setup is rather heavy and bulky. For this product, Gigabyte delivers overclocked chips right out of the box at 1650 MHz, which is plus 7% over the standard 1545 MHz. To get an even clearer picture of how the Gigabyte setup operates, we took a thermal snapshot of the card with removed backplate, which has been mining Ethereum for 30 minutes. One thing to note is that it varies greatly from Nvidia's reference design. From the screenshot of the thermal imager, we can see that the memory modules reach the temperature of 80 degrees Celsius. The temperature of the memory power supply unit is at 62, and the GPU reaches 58 degrees. Let's sum up then before we get into the test. Gigabyte has conducted an extensive job on the NVIDIA's products. The cooling system was substantially modified which helped to increase the working frequency of the GPU. Who wouldn't want a faster 2080 Ti? So let's move on to the test. For the initial part of the test, we'll use the pre-installed OC Ubuntu 16.04. We will also take the latest NVIDIA drivers version 410 with the CUDA version 10.0 package. The latest version of TensorFlow version 1.13, ResNet 50, will be used to set a benchmark. All the download links will be in the description below. The methodology will be as follows. Each card will be tested by itself and then in pairs. Those in pairs will be tested with and without the NVLink bridge. For the two card setup, it will be interesting to see if anything changes once the NVLink is added. This technology only became available to the gaming cards market with the release of this particular card range, making it the main development for the RTX. Before that, NVLink was only used in rather expensive scientific setups and the enterprise segment. First, we will test the cards that are directly attached to the motherboard. It will be important to show how based on a single card, different PCI Express bus settings can be used. Data for X16, X18 and X1 bandwidth respectively will be revealed. After that, the card will be connected to a PCIe riser card to compare that to the X1 PCI riser card bandwidth figure. As per our experience, this reveals that the width of the PCIe channel has a negligible impact on performance. So primarily, everything depends on software. Here in Kamino, we are producing our own PCIe riser cards, which we use in our mining devices. They use only X1 of the PCI Express X16, which is enough for mining. We will not show every single testing screen, as there is simply no need. We will show just one, and then reveal the overall table of results. Now we will launch the TensorFlow on the two cards where the NVLink is installed. To find out if it is enabled, a simple NVIDIA-SMI command can be used. We are launching the NVIDIA-SMI where we can see that NVLink is installed and here we can also take a note of the OS. Now we are launching TensorFlow itself and we are getting 606 image per second as a result at the normal accuracy. This is higher than when running a test without NVLink where we got 584 image per second and also when we ran two 1080 Ti's which got us 430 image per second. 
From that, we can deduce that NVLink is not crucial to the result, but there are certain aspects where it's useful. While testing out the full line of cards, we obtain results which can be seen in the table. As we can see, when a single 2080 Ti is directly connected to the motherboard at PCIe X16 bandwidth configuration, the 305 image per second reading is obtained, but through a PCIe riser, we can get 209. It's better than the result from 1080 Ti with 215 and 158 image per second, which is 29.5 and 24.4% and lower. But when taking account of the price, which is $699 for 1080 Ti and $1,199 for 2080 Ti, the 1080 Ti is much more efficient given that it's 42% cheaper. Let's now test the video cards while mining without overclocking them. On TensorFlow, the 2080 Ti turned out to be better than the 1080 Ti, but not enough to cover the difference in price. We used Ethereum, which is the baseline crypto when it comes to checking the mining potential. As we did before, first we'll test the cards when they're directly connected to the motherboard and then through a PCIe riser. Once again through this, we'll deduce if the speed of the bus impacts mining. We will use the ETH miner 0.17.0 Alpha 1 miner. You can check the table for results. 2080 Ti delivers the best results with 50 mega hashes per second, but the 1080 Ti is not that far behind with 40 mega hashes per second, a 20% difference. When we are using a PCIe riser, the results remain the same. We also would like to mention 2080 and 2070 video cards, which turned up with rather poor mining specs. On TensorFlow, they deliver similar or lower results to 1080 Ti, and yet they cost more. So, they're only good for gaming. Our final test will feature gaming, as we will conduct a benchmark test for other gamers that prefer to have utmost productivity. We will connect up the two 2080 Ti's with NVLink, which will be supported by an Intel i7 8700K processor and 16 gigs of DDR4 RAM, all installed on an ASUS Apex 10 motherboard. 3D Mark Time Spy was used to conduct the test, as it has good optimization when it comes to multi-GPU. Also, anyone can carry out the same test at home. According to the results, we can see that two 2080 Ti cards working through the NVLink are faster than 99% of tested configurations that are based on 3D Mark. As of 2070 and 2080 cards, they have shown a similar result to the 1080 Ti. Overall, the cooling system from Gigabyte has performed admirably, but it's worth making a note of the high temperatures recorded from the memory chip, which was 80 degrees Celsius while mining. The card turned out to be quiet when under heavy load. Similar cooling is used on all the cards in the range. When talking about 2070 and 2080 cards, they're almost the same as 1070 and 1080, with the addition of a tensor processing unit and the ray tracing technology. Unfortunately, they're not used for mining as of yet, and it's unknown if they ever will be. Same could be said of the NVLink technology. If you are after uncompromising performance when it comes to TensorFlow, then consider 2080 Ti. But if you're looking to maximize your value for money, then 1080 Ti is your choice. 2070 is more than enough for gaming in 1080p. If you are after higher resolutions, then 2080 and 2080 Ti are the way to go. When using a PCIe riser in mining applications, there is no loss in performance. There are some when working with TensorFlow, and we are looking into that issue. Be sure to like the video if you enjoyed it, leave a comment below and subscribe to receive our updates. Until next time.